Hello, this is The Rock Podcast. I'm Denny Somak, and as a rock historian, producer, and best-selling author, I've been collecting lots of interviews over the years, thousands of them, and I try and bring you the greatest stories from my archives and newly recorded conversations, and that's what we have on this episode. Is Steve Katz a rock star? Oh, that happens to be the title of his autobiography, which he put out a couple of years ago. And after you listen to this interview, you can decide. Let me tell you why I wanted to have him on. First of all, you may be asking yourself, who is Steve Katz and why do I want to hear this? So this is the backstory. Steve Katz is a founding member of the Blues Project, a band from New York, more specifically the uh, Greenwich Village area, formed in 1965 and originally split up in 1967. The music was a combination of blues, folk, R&B, and jazz. In February of 2023, they reformed with Steve Katz and co-founding member Roy Blumenfeld and released a new album, Evolution. The other founding members were Danny Kalb and Andy Kohlberg, who both passed away in 2022. One more original member is someone you probably know, Al Cooper. He joined the Blues Project as their keyboardist in 1965 and left the band shortly before they played the historic Monterey Festival in 1967. Al formed Blood, Sweat and Tears with Steve Katz, but left just before they became big with their second album, the one with David Clayton Thomas that had You've Made Me So Very Happy, and When I Die, and Spinning Wheel. Now, I bring this up, and the reason I invited Steve to be a guest is because there's a new documentary out titled What the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears. It's getting a lot of attention and good reviews. In case you didn't know, BSNT was probably the biggest American band in 1969 and 1970. Their self-titled second album, spent seven weeks at the top of the charts. They won the Grammy Award for Album of the Year, and they were the headliner at Woodstock, along with Jimi Hendrix, although they didn't appear in the movie or on the soundtrack album. Then, the band went on a U.S. Department of Defense-sponsored tour of Eastern Europe in May and June of 1970. The affiliation with the U.S. government was very unpopular with their fans, and they were highly criticized. This along with uh, an image problem because they decided to play an engagement in Las Vegas at Caesars Palace, very unpopular at the time, although it's pretty much commonplace today. Many personnel changes and conflicts saw the group pretty much disappear from the popular musical landscape. You will hear all of this in my recent conversation with Steve Katz from his home in Connecticut. So I'm happy to bring you Steve Katz. Hi. Yes. How are you doing? doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. How was your vacation in Mexico? Great, as always. (laughs) Eight years every winter. Oh, all right. Great. Mm. So I'm very excited about talking to you. Very uh, know the history and everything, and we'll get into some of the history. But uh, we're here to talk about a couple of things. Number one, the Blues Project. You reformed it. What's the impetus behind that? Uh, well, Roy and I have been speaking about that for a while, and we've, we've, we've had uh, reunions over the years. And Roy is the drummer, of course, and the original drummer. And right. uh, the two, he and I are the only originals. And uh, we just decided to do this every now and then. So this time we did a we did a tour a few years ago and then another tour last year. And... Uh, decided to do an album also because the musicians are really great that we're working with. Um, and uh, so we did an album and uh, I was pretty, pretty skeptical about how it would turn out, but it came out great. The album's called Evolution and it's currently out and getting some good reviews. And you're actually doing a, a few shows. Well, we were, but uh, I'm, I'm mainly just, just doing my own shows now. Okay. All right. What's the difference between your show and a Blues Project show? My show covers my career from 1962 when I was a folk music uh, person, you know, right. and the Dozen Jug Band and the Blues Project and Blood Sweat. So it goes, goes through my whole career. 
Um, well, not my whole career, but you know, maybe twelve years or so. Okay. So give us a little uh, background. Obviously, I'm familiar with the Blues Project and how you know how that came out. Tell me what happened. You you used were one of the co-founders of the band, and then you you got a record deal pretty quick. Uh, I think from Columbia, but you ended up at MGM. But but start with um, how things came together in the beginning and and the original members. We did a we actually we did a demo uh, for Columbia and and that was turned down. So we, uh, Tom Wilson was our producer and uh, and so we 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 uh, signed a contract with uh, Verve Volkways Verve Forecast, which was mm -hmm. probably one of the worst record labels <laughs> ever. <laughs> and that's a I mean that's a that's a story unto itself. Right, but. Um, I had just come out of the Even Dozen Jug Band, uh, myself, Stefan Grossman, John Sebastian, Maria Muldor, David Grisman, and um, I was still in school. On the weekends, I was teaching at Fretted Instruments in, uh, next to the Waverly Theater on 6th Avenue. And um, it was 65, and uh, things started changing where, where uh, Dylan had played the electric, you know, electric instrument at the Newport Folk Festival. Right. And, uh, so all my friends were like trading in their acoustic instruments, you know, going uptown and and starting blues bands, including my friend uh, Danny Cal. Uh, Danny and I both were students of Dave Van Ronk. And uh, Danny came up to uh, Fred and Instruments and he said uh, his guitar player, uh, Artie Traum, was leaving for Europe and he needed a rhythm guitar player, you know, for his new uh, blues band. And uh, I said, well, you know, Danny, I, I never played an electric guitar before. I don't even know what the dials do, you know, or where to plug in. Does it get plugged in? I have no idea what's, what's you know, about in, electric instruments. And he said, well, come up to the Night Owl tomorrow and we'll have a rehearsal. We'll stick a D. Armand pickup in your uh, in your guitar and in, in my J200. And uh, and uh, we'll we'll go through some Muddy Waters things, you know, high heel sneakers, you know, just simple things, which I knew, you know. So I went up the next day and uh, and I, I plugged in my D. Armand pickup, but Danny had it on 10. And then we put that into the amp and that was also on 10. And so this huge sound came out of the amp. It was the most horrible. So I felt like I, like I was being attacked by a herd of rhinoceroses. It was that awful. And uh, and I just turned, turned down to zero. I mean... It, it it was uh, feedback, and um, and uh, it wasn't until my third acid trip that I learned to love this sound, this horrible sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I turned down to zero. And uh, Danny came up to me afterwards and said, uh, "Well, I, I think you played great. Let's let's uh, you know you're you're in the band if you want." You know, and, uh, he couldn't even hear me. It was funny. So I had a paper due on Yeats and the Byzantium poems at the time, and. Uh, Instead, you know, I just went out and played with with the band, and uh, it was great. You know, I, I got myself some bell bottoms, grew my hair long, smoked some pot, and and uh, that was that was it. I was caught in rock and roll. So the name of this uh, podcast is the Rock and Roll Podcast, and we're the number one podcast for classic rock. So we want to do some history. So forming the band, Tommy Flanders was in the original lineup. Who else was in the original lineup? Well, like I said, uh, uh, Artie Traum, uh, but that that was before there was, it was the that, Blues Project. Yeah, that's a, but uh, of the Blues Project, what was the right, account? right yeah. uh, the Blues Project? It was just uh, Tommy was the only other person aside from me, Roy, Andy, Danny, and uh, Al. Now, Al wasn't the first one in; he was like the last one in, right? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. yeah Al had played on our uh, our demo of uh, the Eric Anderson song "Violence of Dawn." And uh, he wanted to be in the band. We wanted him to be in the band. So you end up recording your first album live, which was a little unusual, uh, live at the Cafe of Go-Go. What made you decide to record the first one live? Uh, the budget. Uh, the uh, <laughs> record company, like I said, they were terrible. Yeah. They gave us practically no money to make. And, you know, we, we only did one studio album, and that was Projections. And the third album was live also at the uh, at Town Hall. But the Live at Town Hall album, half the songs were done in the studio, and MGM had some drunk that they took off the street, mix it, and put some. They put uh, applause underneath the tracks, so it wasn't really live. Mm. Okay. So, what was it like working with uh, with Tom Wilson, who was a pretty renowned producer? Yeah, Tom was great. 
He was he was great, except for one thing. You know, it, like I said, we you know they, the the record company wasn't giving us money and uh, projections. Uh, like I I did uh, my one of my songs and uh, and uh, my my uh, I had like five minutes left to do a, to redo my vocal. I said, Tom, I you know I'm a little bit flat on. Can I redo this song? You know, the, the, my vocal. And he said, "Well, not really, because Eric Burden is upstairs waiting for his studio time. So I didn't, I didn't have the five minutes that I asked for." Right. So I, I, I don't know if you know this. You know, they're they're doing a documentary on Tom Wilson right now. Were you aware of that? Yes, I am aware. Of it. Okay. And Tom and was so, great. I mean, yeah. he, was, he was great. Yeah, because I actually one of the first interviews I ever did was with Tom Wilson in the early seventies. So wow, Marsh, I, I contacted Marshall uh, Crenshaw, who's behind it, and going to be using a lot of that in there because there's not that much material on him from what right. i understand yeah and people say he was always on the phone <laughs> you know i hardly remember working with tom actually i mean i remember he was terrific and and uh, he did a lot for us but uh uh then we on projections we moved on to uh, uh jack nietzsche and uh, you know a couple of other people so we we moved on from from tom where did tommy flanders come from and why did he only last that's Halfway a mystery. Through. Yeah, that was that was always a mystery where Tommy ever came from. All I know is is that uh, we you know we all had uh, like our little apartments in the village, and Tommy would show up every afternoon and and take a shower in one of our apartments and then leave like the Lone Ranger. Hmm. But uh, I think he was from Boston. I'm not I'm not sure. If you run into Tommy, ask him where he was from. Okay, is he still alive? I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought he had passed away, but what do I know? No, I don't think I don't think so. I would have heard that probably, but uh, you know, he he did some of the, one of those uh, exploitation movies after he left uh, BS and T. We left him out in L.A. and he, I think he and did a Jack Nicholson, uh, you know, one of those happy yeah. teenage movies. So you're one of the the people that was uh, I hate to use this, but uh, eyewitness to history. Tell me what it was like in the village. Uh, in those years of the 60s when the Blues Project was coming together and just about everybody, Jesse Colin Young, Richie Havens, Dylan, everybody was around. Give me an idea of, of what, what what that was like. Well, it was that that summer of 65 when I joined the Blues Project. Uh, like I said, we were playing at the Night Owl. And uh, the summer was just really incredible because, uh, you know, all of these kids were coming in from New Jersey and Long Island, you know, to see what all the fuss was about. And the fuss was about rock and roll. In those days, you know, I'll never never forget that hot summer. You used to walk around the streets of the village and just smelled, you know, like uh, Galois and and uh, the, the the scent of uh, espresso and cappuccino coming out. Mm. Now you're walking and it's just like pot. That's all you smelled was pot. And if you turn the corner or up the street at the Cafe Bazaar was like the Love and Spoonful. And uh, then you turn the corner from us and you had the Fugs right around the corner playing in their own theater. Mm. And then next to, to that, you had the Cafe Wa, where uh, uh, Richie Havens was passing the basket. And you had Jimmy James and the Flames. And Jimmy James went to England, of course, and became Hendrix, changed his name to Hendrix. And then you had the Gaslight across the street. And then you'd go down another block and make a left on Bleecker Street. And there was the Cafe Ogogo, where we became the, the house band. So it was... It was any time anybody came into to New York, whether it was the, the the San Francisco bands like the Dead, the Airplane, everybody wound up, or the British bands, Cream, Who, old, everybody wound up in the Village, and everybody wound up at the Go Go, or uh, you know, we we would all have hamburgers at the dugout across the street, and that's that's the way it was. And the, the place was packed with kids, you know, and it was it was a fun time. So practically any of the clubs that you went to, you would see a pre, pretty high quality type of entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, of course, uh, the record companies were down there with contracts in hand, you know, signing everybody. But, uh, yeah, some of the, when, when you see some, some of the posters for the Cafe of Gogo -Go or even the Bitter End, or, um, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, the names that are on there. You know, and then you walk a few blocks away to the Village Vanguard and the Village Gate, and you got all these, you know, you know, Coltrane and Thelonious Monk and uh, New York was an incredible, incredible period for New York and during those days. So a couple of the songs uh, that became, uh, you know, mainstays uh, or your signature tunes in the early days. One was Two Trains Running, which is a Muddy Waters song, correct? Yeah. And the other was the flute thing. And I, I want to talk about those two things in general. 
what the material for the first couple of albums how did you decide what to use what not to and could you you basically have a bit of a jazz background don't you and a, and a folk background no it's just it's just a folk background folk blues stuff like that i i had no jazz background at all you know i love jazz but uh but the chords were much too uh too complicated for me to learn and uh that's, that's sort of like uh, a joke anyway um, so, uh, as far as the two tra trains running, that was Danny's thing, you know, that was Danny's tribute to Muddy Waters. And when you speak about Tom Wilson and, uh, projections, we recorded that on projections and Danny's string, uh, it didn't break. It just sort of got loose and he's tuning it up. It's on the record mm. because we couldn't do another <laughs> take, talk about our cheap record company. Um, but that was Danny's tribute to uh, to Muddy, and uh, and uh, even Muddy liked the way we we did it. We did a very slow version of it. Flute thing, that was Al's. Uh, you know, if you if you take the melody of flute thing, da 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 da, 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 da and think about the ending of a, uh, let's say you're playing in a a club or something, and you end a a song, you know, like a like a jazz take or, uh, and and the the song ends da da da. And then you do, dun, 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 and that's the coda. Well, Al took that coda and made a song out of it. And uh, it was uh, an instrumental and Andy played flute on it. You actually played Two Trains Running uh, with Muddy Waters in the audience at one time, right? Or Yeah. Oh, well, many times. We, oh. we played with the Muddy's band, you know, the Lotus Band on piano and James Cotton on, uh, on harmonica. We played a... a a bunch of times together we we played at the cafe go to go go together many times and yeah muddy would uh would muddy watched it at least once <laughs> and, and told danny that he really liked it just you know for danny to it's that's like having your idol come over and, and say geez i really liked your version of my song it was it was really fantastic for him and this is danny danny calb we're talking about right yeah so yeah all right, so I, I know you've done a, a bunch of different things. Uh, you also had the opportunity to work with uh, some major legends, uh, Sunhouse or Skip James, Mississippi John Hurt. Did you want to give me any comments about seeing those legends? Yeah, well, you know, when I think back, the fact that that I met these guys, you know, um, is just amazing to me because these are my idols, you know, mm -hmm. and especially Mississippi John Hurt. And I got to spend like uh, uh, we we uh, we cohabitated a, a, an apartment in uh, in L.A. Uh, in '64. Uh, John was playing at the Ash Grove, and then Stefan and I and Ry Cooter uh, were a band that was playing at the Ash Grove the week after. But uh, John didn't have any gigs, so he was staying at the same apartment that uh, uh, Ed Pearl's. Uh, it was Ed Pearl's mother, I think, who was on vacation. And uh, right. So we got to be really close, you know. I got to be very close with with John, and uh, and to this day, I, he was just one of the, one of the most wonderful people I've ever known, you know. Aside from loving his music, and to this day, I still do uh, Richland Woman Blues, and and I can play Spike Driver's Moan and uh, Lewis Collins and uh, a lot of uh, John Hurt's things. Very, 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 uh, it meant a lot to me. So when you get to live at the town hall, the band's starting to crack. Was was Cooper already out, or did he stay for the full recording of that? I, I know you mentioned that pieces of it were recorded different places. Yeah, we we uh, Al was still with the band when we did the town hall concert. Uh, then he left, and um, and we did Monterey, and we had John John McDuffie was uh, our keyboard player for the Monterey Pop Festival. And uh, that was sort of like the end of the band was uh, Monterey was one of our last gigs. Now, before I ask you about Monterey, uh, No Time Like the Right Time was from that album. That was one of Al's tunes? That was one of Al's. That was, that was your biggest your biggest song, wasn't it? It was, a, it was our attempt at a hit single. And uh, of course, you couldn't get any hit singles. So. But it appears on all those classic compilations, nuggets, it, you know, you're always yeah. on. Yeah. Well, you know, it's that fuzz tone that I was using. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay so tell me about monterey how did you get uh the gig and al did or did not play with you at monterey um not only did al not play with us but he went on before us and did all of our songs <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's al 
Um, no, we were we were invited, and I think uh, Lou Adler uh, wanted the band with Al, because Al wind, wound up doing like um, uh, stage management or something when he came out there. Uh, and they tried to rescind the invitation, and we said no. You know, you, we're, we're we're going out there. We're coming out whether you like it or not. You know, and uh, we did. We, the, the, the New York bands weren't treated. Uh, very well, you know. I mean, us, Laura, Laura Nero got killed, but she did a wonderful performance, you know. Mm. And um, so we went out there and we did our we did our thing. What do you remember about the festival as far as the other acts? Did you get a chance to see any of the others? Well, I got to uh, shake hands with Otis Redding, and uh, I was on the side of the stage when uh, Janice did Ball and Chain, which mm -hmm. was amazing. And Monterey was amazing. Uh, uh, then we, I had dinner with Jimi Hendrix backstage. It was just a hot dog stand, yeah. but uh, we had hot dogs together. And you know, and, and I wrote my memoirs. And uh, my my book company said when they put out promotions, they said, "Oh, Steve jammed with everybody from so and so to Jimi Hendrix." I never jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I shared a bag of potato chips with Jimi okay. Hendrix, okay. And, which I think is a, a lot hipper than yeah. Uh, how many people, everybody's jammed with Jimi Hendrix, but how many people have shared a bag of potato chips with Jimi Hendrix? So the inevitable question is, what was Jimi Hendrix like? And did you ever conceive that he was going to turn out to be what he turned out to be? He was he was fantastic. And uh, of course, you know, when, when seeing him at Monterey, it was just, a, he, was, he was beyond human. He was just incredible, but he was a sweetheart. Uh, the last time I spoke to him was at the scene, uh, C. Paul's The Scene on 47th Street, and um, and he came up to me and he said, you know, I'm thinking of uh, of using a horn section in my next album. And would you would you mind if I use the blood, sweat, and tears horn section? I said, you're kidding. That would be great. But he didn't live uh, long after that. Hmm. Okay. So uh, getting back to the blues project for a moment, planned obsolescence comes out, but it's it's not really the blues project, is it? Right. Yeah. That was a contractual thing you had to do. I don't well, know. You, I, you you had already left, so I was gone. So I don't know right. what uh, what was behind all that. For the, so for the historians, uh, that later became C Train, pretty right. much. Okay. All right. So uh, what happens now? You you get together with blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, did Al come to you? Did you go to him? Uh, how much were you influenced by like the Electric Flag and some of the other horns uh, bands that were just starting? Um, Al called me after, uh, cause I wanted to go in my own direction also. And Al, Al always wanted to put horns into the blues project. And we were both listening to an album, uh, by the Buckinghams called Time and Charges, which had the uh, horn section from the Chicago symphony. And it wasn't just a stock R and B, uh, horn section. Um, it was used in a different kind of way that we hadn't heard before. And so, uh, Al had called me because he wanted to move to London. And uh, he put together a benefit for himself so he could raise the money to, to get, go over there. And he, he asked if I, my, myself and my new friend, Bobby Columbi, would join him for a benefit at uh, Cafe Ogogo Go-Go to raise money for himself. And I said, sure, you know, let's do it. You know, so we rehearsed a little. We, had a, uh, we did the gig and nobody showed up, you know, but Al got enough money to get a cab to the airport and back. And so I said, well, since you can't get over there, why don't we start a band? <laughs> and that was it. Okay. And, and the rest of the players, it was like four main guys that started it and the rest of the players just Yeah, found... well, it was, it was uh, me and Al, uh, Jimmy Fielder, Bob, Bobby, and Freddie Lipsius. So we had a okay. sax player. Right. And then we wanted to put a, together the, a few more horns, you know, so through Bobby and Freddie, we got some great horn players and and and... They weren't just horn players. Randy Brecker, you know, I mean, these guys were great, you know, and they brought something extra than just a horn section. You know, they, mm -hmm. they brought their, their playing, their, their expertise, but their personalities also. And that's why the first Blood, Sweat and Tears album is so nice. Okay, so there's a bit of a, not a controversy, but there's two sides of the story. What, what, uh, why did Al Cooper leave or was he thrown out? Well, it was, it's actually my side of the story that, that, uh, <laughs> he, okay. wasn't thrown out. he wasn't thrown out we uh bobby and i uh wanted uh, a better singer and we felt that one of the reasons why child's father to the man was not a hit album 
was because uh, was that uh, Al's vocals just weren't strong enough. And so we went to Al and we said, you know, stay with the band, be the leader, the writer, do, do whatever you want, you know, but we need a lead singer. And Al said, no, I want to be the lead singer. So he left. And um, that album has since over time proved to be a, a bit of a minor classic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So who were the singers that you auditioned and who did you think about and how did you get to David Clayton Thomas? Well, uh, one of the singers, or one of the people that auditioned um, was uh, my old friend Dick Wagner, um, who was with a band called The Frost in Detroit at that time. Dick was later a, played with Lou Reed, correct, that guy? Pardon me? He later played with Lou Reed, is that the same guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I was going to get to that, yeah, and Alice Cooper, and uh, and uh, Dick uh, was was a really, really good singer, really good guitar player. And uh, then we auditioned David, who I saw at uh, the scene. Bobby and I had seen him with his blues band. And uh, David was just terrific. It was a choice between Dick, who is like really a wonderful guy and a really talented guy, and David, who had the voice, who, you know, and, um, and we, we wanted that voice, you know, and that's what we did, you know. And, and you know, uh, yeah, that's what, that's what happened. Did you also audition uh, Laura Nero? Uh, well, not really. I think Laura auditioned us. <laughs> we we spent a day rehearsing together to see if it would work out. And uh, by the end of the day, we realized we would just be Laura's backup band. I also noticed uh, some people have said that you talked to Stephen Stills, you talked to Alex Chilton. I mean, is any of that stuff true? Um, Stephen Stills, yeah. I had dinner with Stephen and uh, Jimmy Fielder because Jimmy and Stephen grew up together, sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alex Chilton, I just found out afterwards that he was asked to to do it. You know. That would have been something, huh? <laughs> that would have been great. He's a great singer. At one point, I wanted Paul Rogers also. Wow. He's does, really he know, good... does he know that? No. <laughs> he probably doesn't even know it. I'll, I'll tell him. I know I know him and his manager very well. Oh, he'll, great. Well, I'm a real be. fan of his. So. <laughs> his manager okay. is David Spiro, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. Good, good guy. Yeah. Um, do you know? Well, I knew David when he was a kid, you know, in, at the Upbeat show. Upbeat show, yeah. yeah. Okay. Character. He just put out a, his autobiography, which is... I saw, yeah. <laughs> it's about 600 pages, 400 too long, but it's a great story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, before... Okay, so Blood, Sweat, and Tears comes out, and you have the biggest album of the year. You get a Grammy... You're playing everywhere. I saw the band at that time. I was 19 at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Yeah. There was a press conference before at the Holiday Inn, which I went to. And, I, you know, so it was a big deal. And, of course, you know, you were the biggest band in, anywhere. In fact, uh, you, you ended up being the headline band at Woodstock. Right. So Until, until, uh, the, until uh, Jimmy joined me. Yeah. Right. Well, you solo performer. You're the band. Okay, right. so what uh, what do you remember about Woodstock? I hated it. I hated every second of it. It was getting there was um, was practically impossible. Once we got there, right, it was raining. It was like we weren't hanging out with the kids or anything. We were at the Holiday Inn, and then we didn't go on until two o'clock in the morning. And when we went on, it was like it was like rainy and uh, cold and damp. And we had to be in L.A. the next day, and uh, it just wasn't fun. Not like Monterey. Monterey was fantastic, but Woodstock was just not fun. Why weren't you in the movie or on the record? Well, you know, this is this is a weird thing. I always thought that we weren't in the movie because we had when we signed the contract that we had a percentage of the movie. And so they did. They just stopped the cameras. And then I find out recently because of this. Uh, what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears? Which we'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the director, John Scheinfeld, did a lot of detective work. And what, what he found out, what they found out, was that, uh, was that because uh, we hadn't negotiated the, the, the movie, um, that our manager stopped the cameras because we wanted more money if they were going to do the movie. I didn't know that until recently. Hmm. Okay. Uh, obviously, you've since seen the movie, minus you. Did it capture the event, or did it make it look better than it was? 
I, it was, I have no idea. I just came in and went in and came out. <laughs> was, we were hanging out backstage. We were smoking a lot of dope with the the band and the uh, and uh, we, you know, we went on stage. We did our our we did a terrible set actually, yeah. and it was because the uh, mainly because of the the, the uh, humidity, the horns were not in tune with the rest of the band and vice versa, and um, they they put out well, a couple of years ago this uh, uh, they they remixed everything for uh, the Woodstock uh, anniversary and, yeah yeah the anniversary uh, issue. And I listened to our set, and our set was amazing. I said, I, I called Freddie Lipsius, you know, our sax player, and I said, Freddie, I remember this being an awful gig. He said, Yeah, I heard it, and it sounds great. I said, How did that happen? And then the uh, the producer gave an interview where he said the only problem that he really had was with blood, sweat, and tears because we were so out of tune. So what he did, he used auto tune, <laughs> put it back into tune, and it sounds fantastic. So good for him. All right. A couple other highlights uh, I want to mention. Uh, how did American Flyer come about? Well, that was sort of like uh, put together. I was asked to produce um, a record of uh, of uh, Craig Fuller and Doug Yule. You know, the two of them were going to mm -hmm. do a record for RCA. And uh, I was asked whether I would be interested in producing it. I said, well, I would be more interested in being part of, you know, a musician in the band, you know. And um, so the three of us uh, started rehearsing and uh, it was my idea to bring in Eric Kaz, who was a fabulous writer at the was writing for Bonnie Raitt and stuff at the right. time and Linda Ronstadt. Love Has and No was, Pride, I think was his big Love Has No Pride, you know. And uh, yeah, my, my dogs are going crazy. That's okay. While I, while I shoot them and I'll be right back. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, you, so, do two, you do two albums, but there's an interesting side note did, to those two. We did two albums. We we signed with United Artists because uh, Al Teller, who was uh, the head of United Artists at the at the time, he was new there, and Al said, "You know, I can't I can't give you the money that the other record companies are offering, but is there anything that I can do to sweeten up the uh, you know our, our offer?" And we were sort of like joking around, said, "Yeah, you can get George Martin to produce us." So that's what he did. So George produced the first. Uh, American Flyer album. And what was that like? Working with George? Yeah. <laughs> it was incredible. You know, I mean, you know, like to, to spend a month with George just talking about like how he did this with the Beatles and that with the Beatles, you know, and then he would do a, a background vocal part, you know, with, with us and, and it would be so Beatle-like, you know, that um, there was one song of mine called Back in 57 and George had it go back into the studio and he says, on the, on the chorus here, and we're just going to put it in the background. I want you to all to sing nim, 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 nim. And we thought he was crazy, you know. And he put it in the background and it sounded fabulous, you know. And then he did his, uh, all his uh, orchestrations and stuff like that. So we really got a sense of what it was like for, with him and, and, uh, and the Beatles. And he was such a joy to work with because he was also an amazing human being. And um, just really a good, wonderful, bright and uh, charismatic person. So any particular reason why that band didn't uh, do a little better than they should have? Yeah, uh, we didn't go on the road, for one thing. Uh, we just did a promotional tour. We never played a concert. And um, so that was basically it. We just that certainly doesn't help, does it? It didn't help at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we get to some of your uh, production things, uh, tell me about the reunion in Central Park with the Blues Project. Yes, we. Uh, th that's basically it. You just said it. The reunion in Central Park. Man, you want to play a reunion? Sure, why not? You know, and Al, of course, recorded it and took the tapes down to uh, Georgia to mix. You know, but um, I again, I didn't have a chance to redo my vocal. Word. Al redid all of his vocals. You know, so the first song. That you, yeah, go ahead. No, I haven't even heard it. You know, cause, uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, was the first song you wrote Steve's song? Yes. And uh, it was called um, uh, September 5th was the original. Uh, here's the record company again, right? Um, the song was called September 5th. And we go on the road. And uh, we didn't have cell phones or anything at the time. Mm -hmm. And when we were on the road, 
the record company called our manager and said, uh, Jeff, we have the tapes and the artwork, but we're missing the name of the second song on the first side. So Jeff says, second song, first side, second. Oh, that's Steve's song. Thanks, Jeff. Hang up the phone. We get off the road and I'm looking at the, uh, the proofs, right, of our album cover. I said, what the hell is Steve's song? So like I tell my audiences now that the only reason why I'm going on the road is because I want everybody that I can get to to understand that I would never name a song after myself. But I have to live with this. So, you know, people come up to me and say, hey, did you write Steve's song? And I said, yeah, I'm Steve. So you had a, a pretty unique uh, list of uh, people that you've worked with as a producer. How did you connect with Lou Reed? Um, Lou is managed by my brother um, and this other guy, and we were we were sharing a rehearsal uh, space up in Dobbs Ferry. It was our Blood, Sweat, and Tears rehearsal space. And so Lou and I got uh, really friendly, and uh, Lou was doing... Uh, Lou had just come off of uh, Berlin, and uh, Berlin, which was a, a beautifully produced, a beautiful album, actually, but it was so depressing that I told Lou that I felt like that RCA should have... Uh, uh, marketed it with uh, single-edged razor blades and the cellophane, you know, and because that's how depressing it was. And uh, of course, it was a bomb. And Lou said, "What do you think I ought to do next?" I said, "I think you ought to get a great band together and uh, and do some of the the Velvet songs, you know, over again, and just reach a, a different audience, you know, more of a guitar-oriented thing." And uh, that's what happened, you know. Was the uh, the band became uh, Dick Wagner and Steve Hunter and Dick, who, who, who did audition for Blood, Sweat and Tears and uh, a wonderful guy. I, I knew Dick right in, you know, I spoke to him actually a couple of weeks before he, he passed away. And um, Dick did a lot of stuff with uh, Alice Cooper. And, and um, yeah, so we did Rock and Roll Animal. And uh, which is a live album for those. For it was a live album because, I, I, you know. And his biggest yeah. seller, I believe, right? Yes. And Lou had asked me, you know, what, so I said, you know, you ought to do this and we ought to get it out there like right away. Um, when we, uh, the, the, uh, the applause track, one of the applause tracks was missing. You have two applause tracks in those days. You mm -hmm. didn't have digital, you know, you, where you can, you know, have to, you know, make your own. Uh, so we, the engineer, Gus and myself went back to RCA studios and um, we saw that somebody had 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 uh, knocked a cable out or something so we're missing a, an audience track so i said what do we do so gus said well let me go into the archive room and find a concert where we can just like fly in the audience track and uh i said okay so he comes back like 10 minutes later he says i found the uh, audience track i said great where is it from he says a john denver concert so half the audience track on uh, rock and roll animal is from a D john denver I think that's what killed Lou, actually. He probably found out about this. Anyway. It's a great story, though, isn't it? Most people don't know story. that story. It's actually true. <laughs> okay. So um, you leave Blood, Sweat, and Tears after what? The fourth album? Fifth album? I, I fifth can't... album, yeah. Fifth album. Yeah. Now we got to talk about the documentary that's out. Whatever happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears? So this is a, a new like documentary, whatever you want to call it has just like resurfaced. It's now out there and there's a lot of buzz on it. Tell me what the genesis of that was. Well, we, our, David was, uh, our singer was, uh, had, a, had a juvenile delinquency record in uh, Canada. He's Canadian. And so the Justice Department or the, uh, they told us that we were, they were gonna uh, take away his visa or his green card. And uh, so we would lose our lead singer. And this is the time, you know, when we had all the hit records and everything. So our manager uh, made a deal, or a manager, he was like our agent at the time, made a deal with the Justice Department and the State Department that we would do a tour of Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain, representing American youth and the Nixon administration and all of that stuff. And... Um, and and do this this tour this cultural exchange kind of tour and um so that's what we committed ourselves to do i didn't want to do it i was the the leftist in the band the political one and uh i i stayed home when uh, 
Elliot Richardson, the, the Assistant Secretary of State, had a reception. And I stayed home and um, and did interviews saying that I don't, didn't think that we should have done the tour or that we could do the tour. But then we did the tour and it was pretty amazing. And then I realized it was sort of eye-opening in that thousands and thousands of kids would come see us, not just kids, but you know people our age, mm -hmm. would come see us and they loved it because they, they, they didn't have a chance to see rock and roll live. And um, they just went nuts, you know, and, and, and it was, it was, and, and of course the governments tried to crack down. We got kicked out of Romania and uh, it was just weird being in an authoritarian situation, government situation like that, you know, and seeing what that life was like over there was uh, pretty eye opening. So of course we came back and said, wow, you know, we're lucky to be in America. So everybody said, you know, the counterculture that our base said, well, these guys are like, have become like uh, pro-American type, you know, it's, it wasn't like that at all. We were just saying, you know, we made a lot of people happy over there and we were glad about that. Hmm. So you remember uh, the trip pretty well, visiting those countries, which at the time, of course, was behind the Iron Curtain. Oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's an experience, you know, you don't really forget. Now, are you uh, surprised? I know it's early days, but you're getting some some ink on this movie. Are you surprised that 52 years later, people are asking whatever happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears? It's, it's amazing. You know, I just thought when we came back, we got killed for it. We got we lost a lot of our audience, and then it just sort of like faded away, and our popularity went down. We sold less records. You know, we. Um, I'm, and it's just amazing that that uh, after all of this time, somebody actually found because we weren't allowed to say anything about why the why we did the actual tour. Mm -hmm. The deal was made; that was it, you know. And then everybody forgot about that as time went on, and everybody forgot about blood, sweat, and tears as time went on. <laughs> so uh, all you know, and then then uh, uh, John Scheinfeld comes along, the director, and he says, you know, this this is an amazing story because it actually is because. Uh, he went into the files of the FBI, the Justice Department, the uh, the State Department, the White House, because Kissinger and Nixon uh, signed off on on this and said we should do more, and uh, and so he brought it to life again, and 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 it was something that that uh, the truth just wasn't out there until John made this film. And uh, the film is sort of like a, a thriller, which is what it was, you know, leaving Bucharest, you know, with the uh, with with the film cans, you know, in the in the seatbelt boxes and stuff like that. You know, so it's a pretty amazing time. Now I know it's going to open in theaters. It hasn't opened yet, right? But it's going to be opening in theaters. It's opened in uh, uh, well, it opened in New York, I think, in a few theaters in the East Coast, and it's opening on the West Coast, and then it's going to go into full openings, I guess. Uh, uh, after that, and then uh, God knows what what uh, what they plan to do, you know, uh, distribution wise. You know, I guess uh, you'll go into streaming and stuff. Right. So, how many of the uh, of that era of Blood, Sweat, and Tears members are still around? Well, uh, two of us have passed away: Dick Halligan and Lou Soloff. Uh, otherwise, everybody's still around. Have you been in touch with them? Not really. Uh, no? you know, I spoke to Bobby a few months back, and uh, uh, you know, Jimmy and Jimmy Fielder and I are in touch every now and then on Facebook, but uh, not really. I mean, it's all, you know, it's like a, it's like a marriage. You know, you get a yeah. divorce. And, uh, have you seen some of the reviews and some of the things that people have written about it? Yes, it's it's fat, fantastic. Um, some of the things are really great, and I'm I'm just. It's very moving for me, you know, it's very emotional because it was something that we couldn't really even talk about and then people didn't care about it. And yet it was an exciting, thrilling kind of story about what happened. And uh, it was something that, uh, you know, we got killed over it and we shouldn't have. So had Blood, Sweat and Tears stayed together in the configuration of the second album, what do you think would have changed? Anything? I I think staying together is is uh, I, is it I, tough I, because the, the band had what nine members, ten members? What did you have? Yeah, there? yeah. Well, you know, but the the, the choices that we made for the mm -hmm. third album, I felt were were wrong. Uh, some of the songs, um, some of the arrangements, 
uh, we shouldn't have done sympathy, sympathy for the devil, for instance. And I felt that the that the third album was just not as as good as the second album. It didn't have the, the, the and a lot of that was because we fired our uh, our producer for the second album. It's weird, you know. You sell four or six million copies, and then you fire the producer. It's sort of insane, you know. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Garcia did a great job, and so, so for those that don't know, he later went on and created Chicago and Chicago, all those yeah. records. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there were three things that I felt were uh, contributed to the downfall of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, not just the Eastern European tour. First thing was we played Las Vegas, which of mm -hmm. course the counter our counterculture <laughs> fans hated. Right. Well, we had a great time. Uh, the second was the, um, the Eastern European tour. And the third was the third album, which just wasn't there. I mean, it didn't have the singles, a lot of the second album. It just, uh, it just didn't, it just wasn't there. It didn't have the production values of the second album. I got to tell you, uh, you know, there is still a blood, sweat and tears out there, obviously with, with no original members. I actually saw them on the flower power tour. Mm. And because they're great musicians, the show is great. Do you think there's any possibility that any of the original members would get together for something, even if it's a one-off? No, the, 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 the band the band that's playing now is great. Those musicians, those guys yeah. are, yeah, are tremendous. Uh, it reminds me of uh, when we were playing a, a gig in Athens, Georgia, at the University of Georgia. And afterwards, we went to a, to a club to see there was a Blood, Sweat and Tears tribute band playing at the club so we think oh this will be fun you know they were twice as good as we as we were <laughs> it was very embarrassing um no we, we would never get together again i don't even remember any of the chords you know and uh, and uh bobby's not playing drums anymore um uh, jimmy's playing a little bit you know but uh, uh it wouldn't be the same thing uh, it would be missing our youth for one yeah. thing so when you do your uh, your shows now do you aside from Steve song or whatever. Do you do any BS and T songs? Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? Uh, from the first album, I do uh, uh, Morning Glory by Tim Buckley that, that I did. And also I wrote a song called Megan's Gypsy Eyes that I sometimes do. Um, yeah, well, my, my, my thing is uh, just me and acoustic guitar. And, uh, and I, I have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, you know, where I show slides and I can crack a lot of jokes and, basically tell stories and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the hell out of it actually. It's a good time. Have you had a chance to play on any of those like cruise tours uh, yet? Or, you know well, what I'm well, talking I, about, right? I, I did that and I went back with Blood, Sweat and Tears around 12 years ago right. for a few years and uh, we did one cruise and, right. uh, and the way I define uh, a cruise is like, it's like a bar mitzvah that you can't get out of. <laughs> and, uh, I hated it, <laughs> you know, and then you're on stage and you're sort of wobbling, you know, and, and um, yeah, I, I will never do one of those things. Never again? Ever again. Okay. All right. Let me uh, get to a few more things and I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, I read your book, Is Steve Katz a rock star. So I need you to, ex by the way, you're going to reissue it now that all this uh, action is happening or? Well, I can, you know, if, if uh, yeah, I would, I would like to, I mean, it's still, it's still selling evidently because uh, it's, it's in paperback and uh, yeah, I would love to have the rights. I would love to buy the rights back, you know, but, uh, but uh, no, it's still doing well. So you should write to the publisher and ask for it. I, ha I had a book published by William Morrow and I said the same thing. How do I get this book? There's a book about the Beatles. And they said, well, just write to the publisher. You'll be amazed. And next thing I know, three weeks later, I got a letter saying, you can have the book back. No money. I, I, yeah, well, I have an agent that does that. And she's actually, my, my agency represents Colleen Hoover, who now has like three books in the top 10 mm -hmm. uh, fiction. And uh, so I guess they're, uh, oh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. You know, I don't want to get into the publishing because I'm happy that if somebody wanted to publish right. the book. So. Right. Yeah, and I, I got to tell you, when I first saw it, I thought, hmm, I wonder what this is going to be like. But it was a really good book. You told lots Thanks. of stuff. Uh, now I got to get to the elephant in the room. Tell me about the bottom line shows and why you and Al Cooper don't see eye to eye. That was in 93. And Al had called me and said, uh, uh, he said, I'm, I'm going to throw a birthday party for myself at the bottom line. 
I'd like it to be uh, most of the people from uh, Child's Father to the Man, not Bobby, because uh, Al thought that Bobby was stealing royalties from him. Da -da 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 -da. Typical uh, rock and roll story. Right. And um, and with and the Blues Project, and uh, we would do shows, you know, at, at the bottom line. And uh, and I said, sure, that would be fun. You know, yeah, I'd like to do that. So the night before we were uh, at rehearsals at the uh, studio instrument Reynolds and Al hands out contracts. <laughs> so what is this? You know, I just, just, I just said I would play at a party and all of a sudden I have to sign a contract, you know, if I'm going to sign a contract, I want to get paid. You know, so so uh, he recorded it. I didn't sign the contract and I took my name off the album. They had to take your parts off too, right? I took my parts off, yeah. Hmm. What were those shows like? They were great. Yeah. It's actually you can see you you can you can um, you can see it on YouTube on uh, at the I guess Al Cooper at the bottom line or something like that. And have you, have you spoken to Al Cooper in the recent no. times? No. no, not since then. Not since then. I mean, yeah, yeah. This, I yeah. mean, through, through Roy sometimes, you know, but uh, not really. I um, notice on your website you have all the albums you were involved with and. One that's I, why is the first Leonard Skinner album on there? Are you playing, playing on that record? Uh, yeah, I, I do a harmonica solo on uh, Mississippi Kid. Oh, okay. I just thought it was. <laughs> wait a minute, Leonard Skinner. It's got to be some connection. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's and it has nothing to do with my southern roots. Right. More like my southern roots are in southern Poland, I think. So. Right. Well, I I urge people to check out Evolution. It's a uh, it's a nice album. It's a lot better than than I was thinking it would be. Yeah, me too. Um, you're doing your own shows. Uh, if there's a call to do blues project shows, will you will you do some of those as well? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we you know we did the album and then we were looking for uh, bookings. We were looking for an agent actually. Okay. And there was nobody that was interested in, which is a shame because our our live show is really really good. So. So uh, everybody's going back to what they normally do. I'll tell David Spiro you're looking for some help. Say hi to David. <laughs> I will. You know, he's, he manages like a half a dozen people now. It's good. I know. Yeah. John yeah. Fogarty and uh, Dickie Betts, and he was had Cat Stevens for a while. And yeah, we're we're, we're we're friends on Facebook. So I'm okay. David. All right. Well. All right. Anyway, I want to uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, if uh, people want to. To get a hold of you you have a facebook page yes i have a facebook page and i also have my website which is i have to remember the steve katz music dot wordpress dot com mm -hmm. and that's because somebody took the name steve katz dot com and uh he's I'm a veterinarian i think in in somewhere what he's a veterinarian in north carolina no no no, no. he was a veterinarian but with my name was in new york state and he got busted he was like he was like an arch anti-pot uh, uh, advocate. Right. He got busted for smoking a joint while he was driving. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Well, anyway, Steve, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Wish you a lot of luck. And hopefully I'll get a chance to, to see you at some point. I live down in Florida now. But oh. uh, if you ever get down here, uh, I look forward to seeing you. Well, so. I would love to, but unfortunately, your governor has makes it doesn't make it very. Boy, easy. don't remind me. I, I only moved here full time recently, and that's the one downside. But we'll let it go for right now. Anyway, thank you, Denny. Thank you, Steve. Talk to you soon. That's my conversation with Steve Katz. I highly recommend you see the documentary, What the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And if Steve comes to town, go see him. A great show. Thanks for listening and being part of the Rock Podcast. Tell your friends. They can hear us. We're available at all the usual places that you get your podcasts. And we have a video version on YouTube. You can also sign up to our channel and you'll be notified when a new episode is released. And of course, it's free, no charge. Just a lot of rock and roll stories. The Rock Podcast is the number one podcast for classic rock. And I thank you. This is our third season, so you can check out all the previous episodes. We have John Anderson, The Doors, Billy Gibbons, The Zombies, Nancy Wilson, Led Zeppelin, Bruce Springsteen, Pink Floyd, Kate Bush, and many others. We feature new interviews as well as classic conversation from my archives. 
You can find us at the website, therockpodcast.com, and on Facebook. And you can send your comments, questions, and suggestions at hello at therockpodcast.com. I love hearing from you. Till next time, I'm Denny Somak, and that's it for now. Thank you.